There's uh, actually a little more to that story. I was uh, stitched up by a lovely fellow named Charlie Aquadro, who had been the surgeon aboard Jacques Cousteau's Calypso. Um, had been being the operative phrase, because from time to time, Charlie would lift a brown paper bag to his lips <laughs> and then adjust his bifocals and look down once again at my bloody knee and say, well, this is gonna hurt, but it, I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyhow. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> that, was, that was an interesting adventure for me. The, um, the sense of majesty, 200 and some feet down, being maybe seven or eight feet from the monitor's turret, was really awe-inspiring. I still can't find words to put into it, having read about that storied vessel for years and years, and then to actually see it in the iron, so to speak, and I could see the dents in its side made by the Virginia's solid shot. Um, there was a really a marvelous experience. I'm sure many, maybe most of you have been to the Mariner's Museum at Newport News and have had an opportunity to see the actual turret of the uh, monitor. If you haven't, uh, go, it's, it's worth seeing. And that was a tough old bird of a vessel because it's not generally known, I think, that during World War II, the United States Navy depth charged it repeatedly because it showed up on sonar like a German submarine. And so all the, the understructure, as you know, when it sank, it pancaked and it came down upside down with the raft on top of the turret. And uh, the underside of the, uh, the raft was just bent inward and blown away pretty much. But all the interior works were still there in that magnificent example of, of American industrial and engineering know-how. Uh, hands up, everybody who's a fan of the TV show NCIS. Okay. What's the one phrase Leroy Jethro Gibbs repeats over and over again? There's no such thing as a coincidence. Stupidest line on TV. I don't blame him, it's the writers. Co coincidence is all around us. It's, uh, it's, riddled throughout our history. And my own story with what I'm gonna talk with you about tonight is nothing but not a prime example of coincidence. Surely it can't be divine intervention because I don't stand in that good a stead with people in the balcony. I'm glad to see, by the way, and thanks for having me back, that the people who don't pay their dues on time are still banished to the balcony. Hey, up there, hey. Years ago, I wrote a biography of John C. Breckinridge, our youngest vice president. An outgrowth of that was a little short book on the Battle of Newmarket, Virginia, which you're probably familiar with. Not the book, sadly, but certainly you're familiar with the battle. And um, I had learned already that houses all over the country, particularly in the South, I think, but all over the country, there, there are hundreds of them that still had an attic nobody's gone into an old shiffer robe someplace, nobody had opened the drawers, a shoebox that no one had had the curiosity to look into. And in there, there might be Civil War letters and diaries. So in researching this book on Newmarket, I tried to track down living descendants of all of the principal commanders of the Union and Confederate armies that were involved and found descendants of almost all of them, including the grandson of General Gabriel C. Wharton, who was a Brigadier General, who commanded one of the two Confederate brigades in that, infantry brigades in that battle. So I got his address. I wrote to Mr. William Wharton, explained what I was doing, and asked if there were any papers in the family. I got a very nice note back from him, which I still have, saying he was so pleased to hear what I was working on, but was very sorry to say that there were no family papers. Fast forward a little bit to 1988. Uh, William Wharton was living in a house called Glencoe that was built by General Wharton in Radford, Virginia, still in the family hands. 
And in 1988, the family decided to sell the house because they, they just weren't, they were living most of the time in California and only came back to Radford for summers. Well, selling the house forced them to clear it out. So somebody finally went up in the attic. The attic that had no papers of General Wharton's turned out to have 15 boxes and two steamer trunks full of his letters and diaries. Thousands upon thousands of documents, along with a lot of other things. He saved everything. Today we would call him a hoarder, perhaps. Uh, there are three of his toothbrushes there. So I guess he brushed his teeth free breakfast. Okay, here's this one for lunch. And here's the, the boiled shirt, they used to call them boiled shirts, that he wore for his son's wedding. Some of his wife's dresses. A tremendous amount of material was still there. And among them were 524 letters exchanged between Gabriel Wharton and his wife from 1863 to 65 that no one had ever seen. Even more remarkable is that her letters survived. If you have any experience with Civil War correspondences, you find all too often, as you will have probably, that the woman's letters don't survive, be she wife, sweetheart, mother, whatever, because the soldier in the field will read and reread the letters, fold them up, unfold them, fold them up, unfold them, forward a stream and his backpack will get uh, soaked and so they'll just fall to tatters. But these all survived because he made sure that they did. This is the largest collection like this I have ever encountered in something over 50 years at this game now. Well, where did they go? The family figured they had to do something with them, so they moved them out of an attic that was full of coal dust and mice to a garage in Florida that was full of humidity. And still these letters insisted on surviving. And there they sat for about 12 years until the general's great-great-granddaughter, Sue Bell Heath, Sue Heath Bell, I'm sorry, got curious and started to look through them, then began to transcribe them because she got caught up in the story that they told. And she set out to try to find an historian who could help her with these things and through luck, through chance, through coincidence, or perhaps divine intervention, she found me. And so these letters I went looking for in 1972, I finally got to see in 2016. A little late for the New Market book, but I got to see them. And it began in Washington in a hotel lobby when I first met Sue, and she brought along for me one envelope that she had not herself opened. It was about this thick and on the outside was written in Gabriel Wharton's handwriting, General's Letters. And she let me open it. My wife, Sandra, was there with us. The first thing that came out, I, I almost got tears in my eyes because I recognized the handwriting. It was a four page letter by General John C. Breckinridge, who I spent a great deal of my life working on. Jubal Early, Robert E. Lee, A.P. Hill, James Longstreet, Robert Rose, Robert Ramser, on and on and on. It's a virtual who's who of the Army of Northern Virginia all had letters in that envelope and no one had ever seen them. And that was just my entree into this incredible archive. And yes, there's a lot of coincidence, real personal coincidence actually, when Gabriel Wharton, I'll tell you more about him in a minute, when he first entered Confederate service, his first job was to help organize the 45th Virginia Infantry. My great-great-grandfather served in the 45th Virginia Infantry. He was the founder, in a way, of Virginia Tech because he's the, he was in the Virginia Senate. He's the one who managed to get the Morrell College Land Grant Act land dedicated to the Olin and Preston Institute that became Virginia Tech, Virginia's principal land-grant university. I was then teaching at Virginia Tech. There's a Wharton Street in Blacksburg, named for him because he was a rector of the university. My wife Sandra was in the property management business and owned property 
on Wharton Street in Blacksburg and owned property in Radford that had belonged to the Radford family. Maybe it is divine intervention. Whatever the case, it almost seemed like it was destined that I was to do something with these letters. And what, what eventually we did was is that Sue and I edited them for publication. The book's just come out about six weeks ago. And happily, she turned out, she had no training as an historian, but happily she turned out to have a natural instinct for how to treat historic documents and how to go about transcribing and editing them and then separating the wheat from the chaff. I can tell you, in 524 letters between a man and a woman who were very much in love, there was a whole lot of mush. <laughs> and, and they, of course, we don't write letters today. We write emails, but we don't put mush in things the way they did in those days. I mean, they were marvelous mush authors. Uh, <clears throat> Gabe Wharton, Gabriel Calvin Wharton, born in 1824 in Culpeper, Virginia, into a slaveholding family. Uh, interestingly enough, his sister Emma married a Captain Mitchell. His brother had a granddaughter named Margaret Mitchell, who wrote Gone with the Wind. And there is a tradition in the family that some of the material about Rhett and Scarlet was actually based on stories she had heard about some of the Wharton family. We can't prove that, but it makes a nice story. He went to local academies in uh, Northern Virginia with his best friend, Ambrose Powell Hill. He went through the VMI, not VMI, it's the VMI. They'll correct you on that up there. He graduated second in his class. His best friend and roommate was William Mahone later a Confederate general, and of course, the father of the Norfolk and Western Railroad. He went to school with Custis Lee, with Robert Rhodes and others. He did a variety of things before the war, tutoring, he worked as a civil engineer, um, laying out railroad and wagon routes across the Gadsden Purchase. Um, he, he surveyed a road from Memphis to Fort Yuma that it was hoped in the South would be the route of a Southern Transcontinental Railroad. Of course, they didn't get it, it went North. By 1860, he was a chief engineer of the Virginia and Kentucky Railroad. And in April 1861, when war came, he left his job, he went to Richmond, took a commission as a major, and began working on Richmond's defenses under the supervision of General Robert E. Lee, who became a very good friend. He's 37 years old at that time. He's a bachelor. He's well liked by virtually everyone who knew him. He's easygoing, affable, fun loving. He approached life on the assumption that everything works out for the best. Now, if you've read David Copperfield, he is Mr. Micawber. Everything works out for the best. He did enjoy his younger years, and one of the wonderful things about these letters and his diaries, which were also there, is how forthright and frank both he and his wife are about their lives and their thoughts. In 1854, he, with remarkable candor, he recorded in his diary one evening in Washington when, as he put it, I got on a spree with my friend Odie and others, slept with a woman, visited a house of ill fame, all because we were drunk. I must stop this, indeed I must. And he did, but he still approached romance seriously, if not successfully. By the time the war came, he was a wounded veteran of several emotional attachments that went awry. He's 37, in December 1861, convinced he's doomed to a life of bachelorhood when a chance encounter at Dublin Depot, which is now the town of Dublin, Virginia, in Southwest Virginia, introduced him to Miss Anne Rebecca Radford. She was called Nanny, born in August 1843, thus she was 19 years his junior. Her father, Dr. John Blair Radford, is one of the leading citizens of the community known then as Central Depot, because it was a depot on the Virginia Central Railroad. Of course, it later changed its name to Radford in honor of this family. She received an education every bit as good as Wharton's, 
She could be willful, opinionated, and disinclined to accept the subordinate role that her society accorded to young women. Her mother wrote a little poem about her at that time. As for my nanny, my dear precious child, I have no fault to find in her, though she's quite wild, but is usually gentle and quiet and mild. And though she is mostly disposed to do right, if she changes her mind, it turns to a fight. And for the rest of her life, it did. She was only 18 when she and Wharton met, he's 37. But she was, had at least one fleeting failed engagement behind her, and she too seemed resolved that she was going to live a life on her own. Because she would never find a man whose ambitions and whose prospects matched her own. As she said, I was beautiful and admired as a young girl. I had everything to make me happy. She was remarkably candid seven months after their marriage when she wrote in her journal about what drew her to her husband. I felt a void in my heart when he came and I was satisfied. He had all that I lacked, courage, perseverance, strength and self-reliance. I was ambitious, he was distinguished and would, I thought, be more so. I was weak in my own strength, tired of struggling amid the temptations to which a beautiful girl is liable. She's not modest. She's also not beautiful, if you ask me, but that's another matter. <laughs> kind of an inspiration for twin beds. The temptations to which a beautiful girl is liable, and this great and strong man was ready to take every burden off me to guide and protect and sustain me, to love me and pet me. I did not know at first the extent of my love for him. His influence over me was great, but I thought it owing to his superior intellect. He suited me. I would marry him. Gradually, gradually, admiration gave place to love, and I loved him with all my heart and soul and strength. It's a measure of Nanny's opinion of herself that at the age of 18, she wrote her autobiography. What has she got to write about at the age of 18? But she's important enough to do it. On February 5th, 1863, they became engaged. We know nothing about what passed between them before the engagement. A few weeks later, on March 8th, their correspondence began. And as I told you at the outset, by June 1865, 524 letters had passed between them, and that's not counting telegrams. They were married at Arnheim, her home, which still stands in Radford today, on May 14, 1863. They left immediately for a honeymoon in Atlanta, Charleston, and Savannah. Every moment of it was precious to then Colonel Wharton, and there's an indicator of one of the differences in their temperaments. He was almost cloyingly sentimental. Everything about her was sacred to him. Every moment of that honeymoon was precious to him. He always remembered the numbers of the rooms they stayed in in their hotels in Atlanta and Charleston and Savannah. And as a matter of fact, once or twice in their later correspondence on an anniversary, he would just write a cryptic little, remember room 41? <laughs> For the rest of his life, he kept pinned to a card a flower that she gave him on their honeymoon that he pressed into a book. In Charleston, they became tourists and went out to Fort Sumter to see the site where the war had begun. I think there's no doubt about the depth of their commitment to each other. There was no charm in my maidenhood, which I would recall, Nanny told him 10 months after their wedding. I have parted from every friend and associate of the past without one slight regret. I regret nothing in regard to you and our marriage. It is all dear and sacred and bright to me. Keep in mind how inspirational words like that from the loved one at home can be for the soldier out in the field who's facing the dangers of the battlefield. A few weeks later, Gabe, as she called him, shared his own thoughts about the relationship. As he recalled seeing her at the Central Railroad Depot when he first left 
to go back to the war after their engagement, he wrote, what an incomparable creature man is. I would have given anything to have remained to my, with my darling distressed nanny. I had to hurry off, could not trust myself, and wished many times I had not left you. When I saw you standing on the little porch, waving your handkerchief, I felt like jumping through the car window and flying back to you. I have felt myself more a stranger in camp than ever before. My home is with you, darling. In their letters, one of the great things is that it's possible to follow their growing intimacy as they got to know each other in their letters. And in the process, they discussed and shared virtually everything in their lives and the spheres they inhabited when apart. They came from different political worlds. Both families were slave owners. Her parents had nearly 70, and his family had 24 in 1860. Gabe's family were typical Upper South <clears throat> uh, Whigs who wanted compromise in 1860 and condemned the secessionists as hotheads and traitors. The Radfords were moderate Democrats, more conservative to be sure, but entertaining little favor for the Yankees or the secessionist fire eaters. And it's apparent that neither felt any great spiritual or emotional investment in the new Confederate States of America. Nandy was the more outspoken. In August 1863, she wrote him, I wish I could have some pride in this little Confederacy or feel that it would be a great government if ever successful, but I cannot. I think it's impossible we can ever whip the Yankees. Gabe was almost as critical. I think the cause of the country has suffered greatly by the haste with which a so-called permanent government was established and Mr. Jefferson Davis elected president for so long a time. As you know, his presidential term was six years. My faith in a Republican form of government is very much shaken. It will do for small communities, but not for a great extent of country with diversity of pursuits and conflicting interests. A strong government alone will suit this country. I believe both sections of the old union will eventually drift into monarchy, and that one will succeed which soonest inaugurates the change. As for their president, both shared much the same opinion. One of the great things in these letters is how frank they are about what they think of the people who are leading this effort. Of course, if their opinions of Davis is tinted in part by his long delay in promoting Wharton to the rank of Brigadier General. Early in August 1863, Nanny wrote, I see as usual after a defeat in Gettysburg, six new brigadier generals nobody ever heard before have been appointed. Do you know I hate Davis as badly as everybody does Lincoln? I think if you cannot get promoted soon, I shall turn traitor to my country. Your opinion of Mr. Davis is very similar to my own, Gabe replied, but we must not express it to any other person. His prejudices are too strong and he is too stubborn and mulish when he once forms an opinion for the leader of such a grand revolution. Or in other words, I do not think him the man for the times or the right man in the right place. They shared sometimes differences about the commanders under whom Gabe served. Both were fond of Major General Samuel Jones, who commanded in Southwest Virginia for most of 1863 and into early 1864. But he was ineffectual and was replaced in February 1864, by which time Wharton was referring to him as General Sammy. Sam Jones is one of my favorite Confederate generals because we have more photographs of him than of any other Confederate general except Robert E. Lee. This, this led to what I refer to as Davis's Law which is that the ability of a general is inversely proportional to how much time he spent in front of the camera. <laughs> Jones was hopelessly ineffectual, but a wonderful guy, and he knew how to hold a pose, sort of the, sort of the Cindy Crawford of the Civil War. Wharton had spent much of the winter of 1863-64 in East Tennessee, attached to Lieutenant General James Longstreet's Corps. 
And that January, Nanny told Gabe she thought Longstreet is not the great man some people take him for. But a month later, Gabe disagreed. General Longstreet is a great man. He knows how to fight and will fight. When Major General John C. Breckinridge took over from Jones, Nanny warned her husband that he was a scheming politician. And Wharton himself felt standoffish at first, though extended exposure gave him an appreciation for the Kentuckian. Indeed, when Jubal Early fell into disfavor following the disaster at Cedar Creek in October of 1864, Wharton told her it is rumored that Breckinridge is coming here to assume command, and I hope it may be so. He once thought Jubal Early to be a model commander. In September 1864, just before the Battle of Winchester, he told Nanny, we have a rumor that General Early is to be sent west to supersede General Hood. We would not like to give up old Jubal. He is a crusty old rascal, but a very skillful and able commander. He has the entire confidence of the troops in the valley. I've never seen the privates have so much confidence in any general except General Lee. But then, here's the key to Wharton's view of almost any superior general. Early repeatedly refused to give Wharton a leave to go to Southwest Virginia to see his wife, Nanny. And in October 1864, Gabe concluded, Early's blood is as cold as that of a fish, and his heart seems devoid of all sympathy. While I thought him ambitious, I had supposed he would have appreciated and assisted real merit, but he doesn't. However, no commander garnered the disdain from Gabe that went to a, sorry kids, a North Carolinian, Major General Robert Ransom, who it has to be said was one of the most unpopular general officers in the Confederacy. He was an absolute martinet. No one liked him. But in October 1863, when he first appeared, Gabe told Nanny, I rather like him. He seems full of energy. A few weeks later, however, he told her, I am getting very tired of Ransom, really sick of his airs and pretensions. He spoke of what he called General Ransom's disagreeable proximity. A nice, wonderful way to say he couldn't stand him. And he began to referring to the North Carolinian as Sir Oracle, and my favorite, his Tarnus. His, the tar heel is his Tarnus. I trust his Tarnus will be ordered on duty elsewhere, Gabe wrote in November. His departure will cause no eyes to be moistened. Happily, he liked most of the officers with whom he served. A few men he regarded almost affectionately. Among them, Brigadier General William Jackson, who was somewhat derisively nicknamed Mudwall Jackson. With whom do you suppose I slept last night? Gabe asked Nanny in November 1863. You could not guess in a year, so I will tell you. I had the honor of sleeping with General Mudwall Jackson. <clears throat> it was very late before our wagons came into camp and the old general and I went into a house and shared a bed and slept finely. I was quite uneasy, fearing that in my dreams of you, my precious, I should exhibit too much affection for the old general. But I was very tired and slept soundly and I behaved with great propriety. The Wharton's most interesting disagreement was over the capability of Robert E. Lee. In August 1863, Nanny wrote, I do not admire General Lee as everyone else does. I believe if there had been one great spirit in the Southern Confederacy, the war would be ended. After reading the life of Napoleon, everybody seems so little. As a little Frenchman said here once, Lee is but a corporal compared to Bonaparte. Gabe gently disagreed. He always had to be gentle in disagreeing with his wife, replying that Lee is the greatest man on this continent, at least in my opinion. I have the fullest confidence in the capacity of General Lee. I regret to hear you say you do not admire him. Our only hope is in him. If he cannot whip the Yankees, no one can. 
If he fails, all is lost. I have so much admiration for him that I would surely agree, cheerfully agree to his being made king and give him all the power he might need. Ultimately, again, the feelings of both toward any general hinged largely on whether or not that general took Wharton away from Southwest Virginia and his beloved nanny. Their patriotism is entirely conditional. And this war is really getting in the way of their romance. Of course, it was the war that brought them together. <clears throat> Wharton admitted that he would have resigned his own commission in March 1862 for the fact that he, but for the fact that he had met Nanny by then, and he read her well enough to know that he had a better chance of winning her if he held even a colonel's rank. I cannot hate the war, darling, because it was the indirect cause of my meeting you. She balked, however, when he told her that he regarded our, their separation as a privilege to show how cheerfully we can obey the commands of duty. I cannot agree with you, she replied. I sometimes believe that country, duty, liberty, everything are chimeras manufactured by the minds of men. Could God have intended or created a code of honor which would compel men to such a curse as war? War in which all the bad passions are aroused and thousands and millions of lives lost by the force of circumstances or the blind dictates of duty which leaves them in a place where piety and goodness and righteousness are impossible. He shared her horror of war. Of course, he was seeing it firsthand. War is a sad calamity, isn't it? He wrote after Gettysburg. This beautiful country is almost a waste. Fields turned out, houses vacant, desolation on all sides. When will this miserable state of affairs change? When will we be able to return to our peaceful pursuits and avocations? What a happy old man I would be to lay aside the sword and bid adieu to the excitement and tomfoolery of the military. Even then, however, his perpetual optimism ruled. He remained hopeful right up through late March 1865 when he wrote Nanny that our men seem to be in good spirits and say we will give the Yankees another trial. I hope with success. But meanwhile, they wrote to each other of what they will do or ought to do if they didn't meet with success. We shall be together always if we go away somewhere and enjoying fully and altogether each other's society. We will be happy with each other anywhere or under any circumstances provided we are together. If we succeed, we will select some quiet place far from the maddening world's ignoble strife in our own country. And if we fail in obtaining our independence, we will become exiles. They will talk over and over again about simply leaving the country if the war doesn't go well. Should General Lee be defeated, Gabe told Nanny in August 1864, Richmond falls and Virginia will be abandoned. The cause of the Confederacy will then be desperate indeed. Should I see any probability of such a result, I want you to get ready for a European tour. We will try the excitement of running the blockade. They would leave the Confederacy to its fate and start anew in another country. Neither, I should add, by the way, showed any great concern for the fate of slavery. Uh, the whole subset of what's in these letters, however, is this constant dialogue back and forth as they follow the romance of a pair of enslaved people who belong to Nanny's family, a man named Tim Lewis and, another, and a woman named Emmeline Price. Uh, that's a whole story for another time, but it's very interesting to see how they watch their romance being mirrored by the romance of these two slaves, one who is Nanny's body servant and Tim who stays in camp with Gabe. Slaves will never be safe or valuable in Virginia, again, he said. If I had any large number, I would certainly exchange them, invest in land or purchase cotton, and take the risk of running the blockade to England or France. I wish we were in such a country now, don't you, my love? We have made sacrifices enough for country and patriotism, don't you think? Nanny told him. 
Oh, mercy, if the war would only end, so we could set sail in some steamer and leave hateful America, acquaintances, friends, and all behind. Go to a new country and live alone. The world forgetting by the world forgot. We are so wearied and worn out with this endless war, and yet there seems no prospect of peace. By the way, if a few things in some of these quotes I'm reading you sound familiar, it's because these two highly educated people appear to have memorized the complete works of every obscure 18th century Scottish poet you can find. And so when it came time to edit and annotate these letters, I have no idea how much time I spent looking up quotations trying to find the aforesaid obscure Scottish poets. Uh, they, they have remarkable minds that are incredibly retentive, and the, the depth and the breadth of their reading is really quite phenomenal. In the middle of the conflict came another concern and a mixed blessing. In July 1863, just two months after their wedding, Nanny concluded that she was pregnant. Apparently, room 41 had some good mojo working for it. <laughs> they began to refer to the anticipated baby as Little Radford, assuming it was a boy. By the end of the first week of August, however, Nanny realized that it was a false alarm. Little Radford is no more or rather it never was, she wrote her husband. She did not disguise her relief. I am truly delighted at the idea, except on your account, she told him. I do feel very sorry for you, but it would not be. I declare it's right funny. I was certain twas, it was until day before yesterday when much to my surprise, I was sick as usual. I had every symptom, but it was mistaken. The fact was, like many women of her time and place, she was mortally terrified of childbirth. She was tiny, probably not even a size zero. I mean, her, I've seen some of her dresses, her waist is about this big around. I guess she may have weighed somewhere around 80, 85 pounds. And there had been a number of women in her family who, of course, had died in childbirth, which was not at all uncommon. The thought of the ordeal of labor filled her with apprehension. Wharton was disappointed, but understood her fears and comforted her with the rather peculiar promise that I will never be so selfish as to ask you to make such a terrible sacrifice again. Separate rooms. Whatever measures he took, it failed. In mid-September 1863, just weeks after the false pregnancy scare, they spent several days together. By her later calculation, it was September 15th that it happened, and she immediately reminded him of that day for months thereafter. <laughs> she wrote him of the illness, unmistakable morning sickness. A few days later, she added, my expectations, as I always thought, were right, so much the worse for me. For the next six months, Nanny's letters were increasingly punctuated by fear, gloom, despondency, as she contemplated the future ahead. In February 1864, she told him, as the time approaches, my anxiety and dread increase. I would give worlds if the ordeal was past. <clears throat> Wharton promised to be with her for the anticipated birth sometime in the first week of June 1864, but the war intervened and he couldn't get away. By June 5th, Nanny was writing to him that I am perfectly wretched. I have no peace or enjoyment in anything. I feel like I was sitting on a volcano which any moment may explode. Now I have never been pregnant, but that sounds to me like a mighty good description of the feeling. <laughs> When his son, William Radford Wharton, was born on June 11, 1864, Gabe was with Early's Corps about to head for Lynchburg to meet a fresh invasion of the Shenandoah. He first learned of his fatherhood a few days later, and it mortified him that he could not be there for Nanny in her trial. I have unwillingly been the cause of pain and anxiety to my darling. You have passed through a terrible ordeal. I shudder to think of what you have endured during the last six months and all for me. 
Nanny had already almost given up, depressed not only by his absence, but also by the certainty that she genuinely, what genuinely was pregnant. So farewell domestic bliss and future hopes of future reunion. Farewell, a long farewell to every day and hour of rest and happiness until this dear delightful war is over. And then, and then when gray hair and wrinkles have come, when old age with all its infirmities have rendered life a torture, then we can be together, if indeed the war is over by that time, which is more than I expect. You get a pretty good sense of her mood. By August 1864, Gabe's enthusiasm, optimism, had eroded seriously, especially since the war kept him from the sun he still had not yet seen. My patience is worn out. I told General Breckenridge today this campaign would close my military career. I have sacrificed enough for duty and country. I have no right to be so much away from my darling precious wife and baby. They have claims upon me which I will not neglect any longer. By this time, each had abandoned the ambition that in varying degrees had been a motivation. Gabe's earlier unwillingness to politic for promotion had irritated his young wife at first. You will not have yourself promoted, she scolded him in March 1863. Doubtless in my heart, I secretly admire that delicacy and nobility of character which prompts you to act so, but alas, it so materially interferes with the ruling passion of my life, ambition, that I am almost tempted to condemn it and quarrel with you in good fashion. You will not intrigue for yourself. Just remember you're doing it for me. Two months later, she was self-aware enough to confess to him that so great is my ambition that I would sacrifice peace of mind, happiness, and everything else to it because I know that unless my ambition is gratified, I will be miserable. Yet after three months of marriage, she confessed that as for ambition, every particle of it has fled from me and this moment were the war to be over, I should be willing to retire from the world to some place where no one could ever hear of you again. And if the war lasts and you gain fame and reputation, it would not half pay me for one of the wretched lonely days I have spent since you left me. I know that I have very little patriotism and if I could do it with some sense of honor, I would induce you to resign and let us leave this falling country. I am sure I don't care whether you are distinguished or not, just so you are spared to me and I can live with you forever. How love changes us. One year ago, I would have sacrificed everything to ambition, and now I am perfectly willing to live without one particle of fame, almost without honor, so I could be with you always. It gave, like Nanny, found that ambition took a back seat to their need to be together. In August 1863, he confided to her, I have been in my tent for two or three days, was troubling and rolling about, growling and snapping at everyone who came near me, dissatisfied, tired of the valley, tired of the army, tired of soldiers, tired of everyone near me, wanted to be away from here, was pining for the presence of my dear wife, felt I could cheerfully resign all positions give up all hopes of future advancement and promotion, say goodbye forever to ambition and vanity if I could only be permitted to be alone with you. Life as it is, is hard, it's bitter, it's unendurable. Ambition will not be coached back again. It is gone, gone forever. As Nanny said, I believe all my ambition has been washed away by scalding tears. Finally, their desire to love in peace and quiet, loving and being loved by each other, came with the death of the Confederacy. Wharton spent April and May 1865 without a command in Southwest Virginia, and finally went to Lynchburg to give his parole. He may have been the last Confederate general to be paroled, certainly at least in the East. This, I presume, is my last day as a Confederate officer, he wrote Nanny in his last war letter on June 20, 1865. I feel right blue at the idea of severing the connection 
which, though not pleasant all the time, has been a source of much pleasure to me. I shall never forget I owe you and Willie all the real happiness I have ever enjoyed to my being a Confederate officer. I shall love to remember that always. And he always did. In fact, they remained in Virginia and were soon working to rebuild their region. It takes, would take too long to go into what they try to do. Gabe starts building the Virginia and Kentucky Railroad. They go into coal mining. They build an iron foundry. Nanny runs a hotel and starts to edit and publish a newspaper in which she wrote the editorials on American foreign policy. She then becomes a land developer, taking some of the family property, laying it out in plots, selling it, renting properties, collecting from people who are late to their payments. Wharton, meanwhile, ran for the state senate, was elected, and as I mentioned at the beginning, was largely responsible for getting the uh, Morrell land grant uh, uh, largesse uh, handed over to the Olin and Preston Institute to become Virginia Polytechnic Institute. He worked with his old schoolmate, William Mahone, to help get the Hampton Institute, a black college, started in order to get more of that land grant, uh, uh, more of the land grant land. Then by the 1870s and 80s, he spends a lot of time in New Mexico working for the Department of the Interior, still writing to her every day, hundreds upon hundreds of letters, in which his fingers shot off in an Indian skirmish. On another occasion, he encounters Geronimo. He absolutely loved it and had some marvelous adventures out there. Nanny died April 15, 1890, aged just 46. Her health never really recovered from childbirth. Gabe never got over it. He lived on another 16 years, dying on May 10th, 1906, aged 81, one of Virginia's last living Confederate generals. Through all their endless months apart during the war, it was their correspondence that kept them going. Late in 1864, Nanny wrote to him, your letters are as necessary to me as the air I breathe. Sometime after his death, someone put the hefty bundles of their letters in the attic at Glencoe, and there they were truly forgotten. If anyone saw a simple note that Gabe had placed on top of his huge stack of bundles of letters, mercifully they ignored it. Because on that slip of paper he wrote, when I am dead, burn all these letters and everything else. G.C. Wharton. Thankfully, his instructions went unheeded, and through these remarkable letters, Gabe and Nanny can both breathe again. Thank you all for listening to them. Happy to entertain questions if there are any. The letters, for the most part, are in wonderful condition. Mostly they're written in ink, though sometimes you can see the ink start to fade and they'll switch to a pencil, that sort of thing. Their handwriting is good, so it wasn't very difficult to transcribe all of these. There are very few words that we couldn't read. Uh, and the physical condition is, is excellent. Mice never got to them, humidity never got to them, so they're all in great shape. And where are the letters now? The letters are still in the home of uh, the great-great-granddaughter, Sue Bell, in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Um, there's been some discussion about uh, placing them in the special collections at Virginia Tech, since Wharton is, in some ways, the father of Virginia Tech. It'd be a very appropriate place for them to go. Questions? Let me start over here. And uh, who was first? Here you go. Two questions. Uh, how long was it before he saw his son? And was he ever injured during the war? And did he write about it? If he was. I, I missed the first part of the question. How long was it before he saw his son? 
Uh, he didn't see his son for about eight weeks. And uh, no, Wharton was never injured in the war, um, or if so, he never mentioned it. Uh, there are one or two mentions of being struck by a spent bullet, which you hear a lot of. That is a bullet whose velocity has so gone down that it's just kind of a tap on, on the chest. But he was, uh, he spent a lot of the war in a backwater. Southwest Virginia is an immensely important region for its mineral resources and all, and the railroad that goes through it. But there's not much in the way of substantial scale engagements there. He really doesn't hit the real battles until he joins Lee's army in uh, late May of 1864, and then he's at Cold Harbor and places like that, then back out at Winchester and Cedar Creek. Um, I've read about censorship during the war, um, but it's never seemed to me to be overwhelming as far as censorship of the letters of the, of the, of the military. Mm -hmm. So were there ever any attempts at <clears throat> censoring any of that um, pessimistic outlook that some, both of them seem to have? The question deals with, with censorship during the war. Um, there was censorship of the press, North and South alike, it start first in the Confederacy, later in the North. Censorship of private correspondence pretty much did not happen unless it was a letter to or from a prisoner of war, because then their letters got read. So in a, in, a, in a private correspondence, you could say just about anything you wanted to. You, you really could. And as I think I demonstrated, they did. <laughs> what happened to his son? Uh, what happened to his son, Willie? Uh, yes. um, Willie will go to uh, the, the uh, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, which is virtually all the family go to Virginia Tech since it, they were so involved in the origins of it. Uh, he'll serve in local militia groups, but he'll eventually become an attorney and do a lot of work with his, uh, with his in conjunction with his father's land office uh, work in the Southwest. He will marry the daughter of General Henry Heath who also lived in the Blacksburg area, which is why their, the granddaughter is named Sue Heath Bell. Um, Willie lives, uh, he's the only child they'll have, and Willie lives until, uh, I think the 1930s and 1940s, in the, in, in the house that Gabe built for Nanny, it's called Glencoe, in 1876 in, in Radford. Going once, going twice, and how about another round of applause for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.